Thank you again so much for agreeing to this. I really appreciate it. No worries. Okay, so first of all, could you just tell me how you got involved with One Piece and what exactly you do? Uh, involvement was with One Piece. I mean, it's it's a very long story, but um, as as far as I can summarize it is, um, uh, I first became aware of it in two thousand one, uh, after my first trip to Japan, where uh, at the time I was a very big uh, Dragon Ball fan. And came over and was all about Dragon Ball. And uh, some some very special dudes were like, um, "Well, if you like if you like uh, Dragon Ball, you should really check this out." And they gave me the first three volumes, so I brought those back home with me and um, got through them and was like, "Wow, this is this is pretty cool." And um, like I said, long story, but I'm trying to truncate things just to keep moving along. But um, uh, became a very big fan of it and started um, writing letters to the author about it just you know thanking him for um the series and like saying this is so great it's giving me a, even more incentive to to um to work on my japanese and um uh i did a study abroad here for a year uh 2003 to 2004 and uh during that time uh but but basically by the end of that i was reading one piece entirely in japanese and um <clears throat> kept up with writing the letters came over here through the jet program uh, kept up with the fandom had I, I do have a website about it I don't update it anymore because I'm just busy with official stuff um, for the series but uh, I do have a, a fan site and stuff um, where I translate a lot of things uh, and did like um, I don't know character profiles etc the, the normal thing and uh, kept up with that eventually through serendipity uh, I found out uh, my wife uh I was playing a video game. My wife was like, uh, you know, I want to watch this this TV program. Could you turn off the, the TV? Turned off the TV. And in that moment, uh, there was um, a call for like at the end of a TV show. It was the most popular TV show in Japan. And they were going to set uh, fans versus um, the editors of, of One Piece against each other. And um, it was a call for for trivia fanatics, like super fans, like One Piece super fans. And I was like, oh, my God, like there's actually a lot more to it like i was going through a really tough time of fandom like i was actually kind of separating myself from the series because of some things that were upsetting but um uh i was just like oh my god i was like this is this is my big chance because the author never like got back to me after or he never answered any of the questions that i submitted for like being answered after 11 years of writing and i was just like man i don't yeah I, I thought i get i thought i got what like makes this guy tick and i thought i understood everything but like uh, I, I guess not. I was just going through a real, real hard time as a fan. And I was just like, Oh my God. I was like, this is it. This is the chance. And, um, uh, I sent them an email and they got back to me and they were like, yeah, we want to know more. So tell us about yourself and your fandom and did kind of what I'm doing with you right now. And, uh, eventually after a, a written test and a, uh, an in-person interview at Fuji television, um, they were like, please be one of the contenders. I was like, yeah. So um got into the uh the TV program. You can you can actually view it I think in entirety. It's it's on YouTube. Um not legally but um it's it's on there. It's, the name of the program is Hokotate. And um it's Hokotate like One Piece Mania they call it. It's the One Piece super fans versus the editors. And we did uh two two round uh, um two fights actually. We did the first one was um it actually aired on my birthday. Um, which was a nice, nice present, but we lost that. Um, we lost the first battle and then we had a revenge match later that year. Um, I think it was in like, it aired in like December or something uh, to kind of tie up with one of the the newest uh, one piece movies at the time. And uh, we won that. We, we totally won it. <clears throat> and um, uh, when we won it at the, at the studio, the, well, the recording uh, location, some of the editors of a sister magazine to weekly Shonen jump from Shueisha came up to me and they were like, we were, you know, some of the editors of this publication V jump, which is uh, about video games and stuff. And they're like, we want to interview you about your fandom. And I was like, cool, cool. Um, so they called me in. I did an interview with them about the series and stuff. And they were like, this was a lot of fun. Um, what do you think about being serialized? And I was like, what? And they were like, we, we'd like you to be, um, to have a serialized column. Uh, about one piece and i was like okay 
Um, sure. So for the past, I don't know, 10, 10 or maybe more by now. Um, yeah, more, more than 10 years for past, like 11 years. Um, I've been doing a, a monthly column in the, the magazine V jump. So, um, that's been in there during my tenure of, of that, during like the first year of doing that, um, the one piece website was getting a renewal and they needed content for it. So, uh, again, they came to me and they were like, Hey, we're looking for some content. Would you like to do uh, a column? on the, um, the, the newest chapters, the latest chapters. And I was like, Oh, sure. Great. So, uh, I started doing that. And this was, I think like 2013, maybe early 2013 or so around that time. And, um, uh, the, the basic premise was the latest chapter of the manga and the latest episodes of the TV series. And I would go into them and be like, Oh, did you notice that um, there's this hidden thing or like maybe this is foreshadowing for this event or something. And that's that I still do that. Um, I still have the column. Uh, I still do have both of those um, that are ongoing. I'm almost at my hundredth monthly column for the magazine. Wow. Which is insane to think about a hundred months. But um, mm. uh, and then for the uh, for the website, I'm a, I'm about eight or so columns away from my two hundredth. So. Wow. Um, so how yeah. did you get involved with translation? Uh, translation. Uh, so you, you mean for um for like my, my manga translation work or? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so translation was, uh, boy, that's just a, pretty much a case of like, not what you know, but who you know. And through all of my One Piece work, um, one of the very earliest... Um, people who I went to before I was reading it in Japanese for uh, translations. I could I could read Japanese when I started it, but um, not not to the level I could now. So I went to other sources, not for scanlations, but just textual translations. So you'd have the manga in one hand, and you'd have the text on the computer screen. You'd kind of do like, oh, I don't understand what that means. Look over, and you, oh, okay, one of those. That's how we did things uh, back in the day, and um, uh. The fellow who I went to, um, a guy named Stephen Paul, um, just was like was in love with the series, and he was doing this, you know, non paid. He didn't get paid or anything, but he he translated just text for for fans. Well, it turns out a couple of years later, through getting to know people and whatnot, he became the official translator for the series. Um, wow. So he is he is still the official translator for the manga uh, through Viz. And uh, he and I got to know each other very well through um, a form of entertainment. It's called the uh, the One Piece podcast, an unofficial podcast that's out there. And um, uh, through knowing him, I got to know some people at Viz. And when it came to time, I, oh, and they, they found out that I was a big Monster Hunter fan. Um, so my first real work with them um, was on a Monster Hunter like art slash strategy guide slash lore book and um uh they hired me for the monster part of that so i took it's it's massive this thing is like literally this thick book and i have like 200 pages of, of monster data that i went through and, and i did that that was my first translation work for them um and then i went on to do toriyama uh, akira's um maru what is it maru Marusaku Gekijo or something like that. And it's, um, I think the English translation is like, is Masterpiece, man Manga Piece Theater or something like that. It's, it's, um, I did that work. So that was kind of cool. It's a collection of all of uh, Toriyama Sensei's um, short stories that he did from like the entire, like like Dr. Slump era and Dragon Ball era. Uh, and even before them. So uh, that that was cool to be able to, to get to that. That was another challenge. And then my latest work was... Uh, the Adventure of Die, which is a big series, but unfortunately is not exactly the most popular series abroad. No, I'm not familiar. In, in, yeah, it's it was one of the golden era weekly Shonen Jump series alongside like Dragon Ball, um, but it's not super popular. Um, the anime got kind of hot, um, but the manga is still still a bit lukewarm. But um, do I have it? can't reach it anyway um so that's uh that's some of my work uh, that i do for translation great so what is your involvement with one piece now 
Uh, now I, I keep up with the, the column, the article. Um, I'll also do various types of translation work. Like if the editors have something that's like a letter from the author that's going to be released, um, they're like, hey, can you either A, translate or B, check this for us? Um, those are kind of things I do. Um, sometimes I do their tweets, um, uh, really random things. But other than that, I guess the big one right now is um, the live action. Uh, and I'm the series advisor for the the live action One Piece series uh, on Netflix. And I've been doing that for almost the entire run. Um, before they had Netflix, before they had writers involved, um, I was uh, invited by the author to uh, to have a part, have a role in that. And uh, for sp the past six years, uh, that's what I've been working on alongside everything else. Wow. Is that how long the live action has been in the works? Technically seven years. Um, the pitch wow. was made to the author seven years ago, and uh, they called me in, in, I think it was like May 2020 or 2017, I think was when. So what are you, what are you doing exactly? Are you truncating storylines? Are you revising scripts? Uh, I'm doing, uh, in terms of truncating storylines, no. Our, our goal basically is not to do that as much as possible. Um, but uh, in terms of revising scripts, yes. So we'll get like drafts or we'll get scripts and we go through it with a fine tooth comb and try to find either errors or like this character wouldn't say that or this character would say that or um, uh, how about you use, how about you present it this way or what if you present it um, a different way? And while it's difficult for me to get into a lot of the details of that, um, just for NDAs and whatnot, um, uh, there are many scenes um, that, have fortunately um that they picked up and listened to us on um and especially working with the author um that are reflected in the final series so um that's been been very fun but also frustrating and difficult over the past six years um as we had not only production issues with you know going back and forth between the u.s and japan and obviously cultural differences but uh, a little thing called corona um as well, as well so it's been a challenge but uh looks like it was worth it so were there any major changes made to localize the content for a more Western audience? I mean, in terms of changes, like major changes, uh, there are, of course, uh, characters who had to be um, removed from the series, not for, um, not for content so much as a difficulty in presenting everything in a coherent story that takes place across those eight episodes while still being a meaningful story that does justice to all the characters, which is a very kind of Hollywood answer. Um, but unfortunately that's the kind of answer I, I have to give. But um, uh, I think the, the biggest changes are really characters who had to be removed. And hopefully if you know, everything goes, goes well, maybe down the line, we can weave them back into the story, um, not in different ways, but in original ways, because we're lucky that the author I'm not I'm in, I mean by original I mean um uh honest to the the original manga um because we're lucky that the author usually never forgets a character um usually the characters are always uh woven back into the story somehow um even after all these years sure. most of them are anyway so uh hopefully down the line things that had to be removed or characters that had to be removed for those kind of reasons uh will find their way back into the series and that's not a hint or anything. I have no knowledge of that. Um, if anybody wants to be like, oh, confirmed that, you know, Django <laughs> is, is showing up. No, it's that's absolutely not the case. But Cool. Well, I, I have to congratulate you on the, the Netflix series. I've seen nothing but praise for it. Um, I watched the first few episodes and I was really impressed with it. Um, Thank you. From... I mean, really all around from the casting to the costume, to the set design, to the dialogue. I thought it was all really phenomenal. And I mean, people are calling it the best, you know, anime live action adaptation, you know, ever made. So it's very exciting. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. What were you most excited to see realized in live action? Wow. A um, scene that you were looking forward to? in particular i mean really the the thing that i wanted to see the the most was um how they introduce uh luffy like what is he 
What does he look like? What are the colors? Um, how does he sound? What is the the aura that, that he exudes? Um, I, because if you nail that, then you've got, this, basically you have the series um, because Luffy is so very important to the author, to the audience um, uh, that if that doesn't go well, then probably nothing else will. Um, so the, my answer there is different, maybe perhaps um, from what I was most excited to see, but in terms of what I was looking forward to seeing, um, that that first introduction of Luffy um, was was what I was probably anticipating the most, since that sets the tone for literally everything else. And um, uh, we were very lucky with what we saw. The the writers and the production uh, team uh, cooked up a an absolutely fantastic um, introduction to Luffy that I don't think we could have uh, hoped for anything better. Wow, that's exciting. And I I don't think you can confirm officially whether or not we'll be seeing a season two. <laughs> it, it seems it seems you know very likely. Uh, just pure speculation because luckily I I'm not involved with with those things. Um, you know, in terms of um, uh, Netflix side and what Netflix does or doesn't do. Um, uh, but so pure speculation. I would be shocked. Um, given the the response and given the rotten tomatoes uh i would be shocked um if there is not a second season so i wanted to ask you a bit more about <laughs> your career and your personal life uh, how did you get interested in japan originally my relationship with japan is, is kind of a weird one um because you know a lot of people can point to a certain aspect of it like i enjoyed this or i enjoyed tea or i enjoyed kimono or i enjoyed um uh, japanese baseball or uh, anime manga etc um me i was ever since i i can remember i've been involved with something from japan entertainment wise and for the, you know the better half of my early life i had no idea that it was from japan or what i was absorbing was from japan or what Japan was for that matter earlier on. But um, uh, my very first like big thing that I was into was Godzilla. Um, Godzilla moved on to uh, Voltron and Voltron moved on to um, uh, Power Rangers. Uh, Power Rangers after a brief uh, Star Wars phase kind of uh, uh, morphed into um, uh, the Final Fantasy game series which brought me to the Chrono Trigger game, which brought me to Dragon Ball. And Dragon Ball was perhaps the biggest um, kind of impetus to, to start learning about Japanese culture. <clears throat> because at, I mean, obviously now uh, everybody knows about Dragon Ball. And Dragon Ball is accessible around the world in um, probably most languages. Um, but that was not the case when I got into it. So I was like, wow, this is really entertaining and interesting. But like the internet, it was very young and uh, it was extremely difficult to get a hold of, of the episodes. Uh, so in order to learn more about the story, I, I had to teach myself Japanese. So um, that's what I started doing is uh, around 97 or so summer of 97. I started. How, how uh, old were you at the time? was 13 okay wow yeah you started learning japanese at the age of 13 yes yeah um wow. we didn't have it at school and um we did have what we did have was a, a local college um had uh, exchange students from japan uh so my mom got on the telephone and she was like can, can one of them you know do a tutoring gig and uh, i was lucky enough to get a a japanese tutor uh and she was great um, she was absolutely awesome. Um, she was a super like Spartan teacher. So she was like, all right, um, we only have this summer. So uh, I'm going to teach you uh, as much as you need to know in, in as short amount of time possible. So this is called Hiragana. And your next lesson is in two days. So I expect you to have it all memorized by then. And it was like, w what? And she's like, you're on summer vacation. She's like, you, I know you have time. She was like, I want you to memorize this. So I was like, all right, so I did hiragana in two days, and um, then katakana in three. <laughs> um, wow! So that was the start of, of yeah. learning Japanese, and she had to go home. So after after um, all of that, after that summer, uh, I was kind of on my own until I did the uh, the study abroad. 
Um, but that was that was how I started. Wow. You know, as someone trying to learn Japanese myself, you know, that's that sounds like an incredible feat to learn all those letters in just a few days. <laughs> yeah, hiragana, hiragana, I, I, I got down pat. Hiragana, I, I did get through. Katakana is, is a man, the mm, soul and she and Tsu are still a pain in the butt, but. Um... <laughs> wow, that's that's very impressive. I guess it was easier to learn, you know, when you're younger. I think it's younger and also she she knew me like like she was she had my number she was just like I I know you have time I know you don't have like summer vacation homework so she was just like you're going to study this because if you don't then we're not gonna be able to do anything because all your lessons are going to be written out in Japanese so I was like all right uh, okay um and I just sat down all day and that's what I just did all day um so it was kind of good to get that start I I still keep in contact with her too and i'm very grateful to everything she That's taught wonderful. me wonderful so yeah. where are you living now i'm sorry where are you living now uh, i live in um uh fukui city oh you do yeah oh i didn't realize that i thought yeah. you lived in kyoto or tokyo wow oh no no i'm i'm here in uh in fukui where i uh started working as a jet so well and how long were you with the jet program i was with the jet program for uh, <laughs> when I first came, you were only supposed to have a maximum of three years. Uh, while I was here, that changed and uh, they changed it to a maximum of five. So I maxed it out at five. Um, and then, uh, I started working for, um, the local board of education, um, in Fukui city. And, uh, now I work at uh, elementary schools teaching English. Oh, you're still doing that? Yes. Yeah. That's my, that's my, my day job. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh. So, wow. So, how much time do you? <laughs> how much time? Do you twist, right? Translating nowadays. So translating is is that's um, I don't like to take weekly projects like weekly um manga translations because I have too many other responsibilities, um that are just random. Like uh, for One Piece stuff, they'll be like, hey, can you come to Tokyo tomorrow? And I'll just be like, well, all right. And I got to drop everything and just, you know, head out. Uh, and if I'm in the middle of doing that, then I, I can't responsibly take on um, translation projects um, that are a weekly. So what I try to do if and when I do translation uh, are take on projects that are either large chunks of established uh, series so that i'm not doing it weekly so like die i mean the adventures of die um like that finished like oh, decades ago so i mean like that i can work on it no problem there's there's no pace uh, issues at that monster hunter same thing it was a big book it's not you know a constant weekly deadline um that just doesn't work for me um if i was do if i were to do translation work i would i would not be able to to be so picky um i would probably have to take on a lot of uh, a lot more work and um and uh, pro uh provide the the translations on a on a more um rigid weekly or or monthly basis so i'm very fortunate to be able to to pick and choose like that mm. so what do you find most difficult about translation and what do you like best about it hmm uh this is maybe a a popular response from translators so i don't know if this is particularly unique but um specifically in the field of manga translation um finding the voice of the characters is, is for me what's most difficult that doesn't mean I, I dislike it it's actually probably the most fun part of the, the job is is figuring out that voice um but until you find it and you have you know this back and forth with the editor about like, um, you know, I don't, I don't think they'd say this, or I think they would say this, or, you know, I know this is for children, but I think I need to argue for them to be able to use this word or that word. Um, do you think we can? Yes, we can. All right. I'm going to use that. And it's going to be part of the vernacular. Um, it is extremely difficult to find out who the character is um, without having a sit down with the author. Now, sometimes you can get like, like aspects of the world from the author uh, and those are those are nice for like um, a specific religion. Religion is such a pain in the butt. 
because you have to know if somebody is talking about God or gods or, you know, a, a separate thing or how they want to refer to. And that, that's a whole other thing. But um, if you could sit down with the author to talk about this character, um, then it would be a, a, a little bit easier. But we have to go on our, their speech patterns and their, uh, their, their quirks when they talk and how they talk and um, how they use uh, san or don't use san or sama. And uh, from all of those those cues, you have to form the character. Uh, and that in a weekly series is an absolute nightmare because you don't have that, that um, basically that, that um, uh, 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 words escaping me right now, but that, um, that kind of pool of data to pull from. Like, like with Dragon Ball, like you can look at the entire series as, as it exists. Whereas something with Die, or excuse me, with something with a, with like a weekly series, from week to week, you're finding out more and more about these characters. So if you pick a voice for them and you find out a couple chapters later, like they actually have a, a different side or like that's that's actually not, even though they appeared that way, that that's not actually quite how they are. Um, you have some, some tough decisions uh, to make when it comes to proceeding with that character along with your editor. And if any edits need to be made to volumes that come out after that. And that's just a nightmare for me. Um, so I, <laughs> that's why I, one of the many reasons I try to avoid weekly, um, I have nothing but respect for the absolute, um, you know, uh, uh, level, level galaxy brain translators out there who just take on weekly series um, like true paladins and, and soldier through it. It's amazing. Wow. So how are you able to convey a character's emotions or onomatopoeia or invented words? How does that look like? Yeah, onomatopoeia are, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. They're a, a pain in the ass. I'm sorry. Um, can I say that? Is that all right? Sure. Um, onomatopoeia are such a pain uh, because there are easier ways to, to express them um, through like just making noises to yourself. You're constantly making noises. That's all you're doing as a translator is making noises for, for manga. You're constantly and uh, you're constantly doing that and trying to figure out how does that fit into to text and your editors are battling you because the editors want you to do, to use words. They want you to be like drip drip or like um, like like punch or like bam or like boom or like established words and there are times where it's just like that doesn't convey what we're trying to do but you're also at the same time fighting the the um the word count which is so much dif more difficult um going from japanese to english than the reverse just because of the size of bubbles uh and the poor um which is another art the um the the person who does the the text layout um you can make a nightmare for them as well if you go nuts with with the sound effects so yeah they are they are really tough and basically how you deal with it is just like I said, is, is you're constantly just making noises. I'll be sitting at the computer. My wife thinks I'm, you know, unhinged. I'll be like, and she'll just pick the Um, So it, it's a lot of that. Um, Another kind of, kind of way of, of, of finding the characters or how you find the characters is, as I was kind of describing earlier is, is looking how they, they talk to other uh, characters, how they relate to them, the kind of um, Japanese phrases that they use, um, and whether uh, the big one is is whether they're using san or not, or right, or like sama or how they address people, um, because those are the big clues that the Japanese people pick on. But it's it's funny as we used to watch. Uh, I used to watch movies with my wife, and um, she she'd be like, "Oh, well, that's the older brother," and I'd be like what how did you even know they were brothers let alone that's the older brother and um she'd just be like oh well you know he 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 said like um he said like or, um he said like ani or something like that at some point like like older brother and i didn't even pick up on it and it's just like because one because i missed one word like i had no idea who these how these two characters were related um and um because i missed that like i miss out all these these plot points to that to that end and how their relationship is actually a, um uh, has been established so those are the kind of cues that you have to look for um when finding the voice or finding that that uh their 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 aura great 
And what about invented words? Because I know, and often, especially in fantasy, there's a whole new vocabulary that, <laughs> you know, people will come up with. Yeah. So how, how does Those... that work for translation? Those can be the most fun and the most dangerous um, because if if you come up with like let's say there's a word play or like a double entendre um, that you don't pick up on and you didn't convey that and it ends up being a major plot point um, and you thought that something else sounded really cool so you went with that um, that's just a nightmare. Um, we were just talking about one actually in One Piece um, there was an island that for years the the japanese name is rafteru rafteru and um in english we were like oh raf raftel okay so it's raftel is the name of the island and it's super important like it's end game like island stuff we're talking about and uh it turns out like 20 years later the author revealed that that the name is laftel which is like like laugh and tail a, a funny story uh and it was just like uh oh um you know we we came up with with raftel not not me but i mean the people you know the the the, the publication side is like we came up with raftel and like but there's no way we could have known that it was supposed to be laugh tail because like dafu is like okay we kind of get laugh out of that but like tail is not teru it was it's it's teru but tail even in katakana is te iru teru and you might even have like a nobasubo in there or something right so um they, they were like we, there was no way we could have gotten this so what they had to do is is just you know they, they didn't revise earlier editions but from that point on they just had to use laugh tail um and that's that's why fantasy terms are just they're the worst because they can be so much fun, but this is this is why, and this comes back to having the established full series available and that pool of data to come from is so much easier than a weekly series. Mm -hmm. And um, what are your thoughts on AI translation and the future of AI scripting? So um, AI translation, where it stands right now, um, and I'm not I'm not Mr. Anti AI. I'm not like viciously against AI. Um, but where it stands right now is I honestly and truthfully believe that it is garbage. Um, uh, in terms of uh, daily conversations, uh, getting people to survive, you know, when they're traveling abroad, a uh, cool, great. Um, but there is so much that is that is missing from uh, character relationships and. Um, uh, just kind of what we, we I've been talking about throughout this entire thing, that thread of like the voice of the character um, there, it, it is impossible um, for AI to get that where it is now. Um, I'm not enough of a tech savvy person to know how much, how many more years are necessary for it to reach that level. But it, it's kind of a double-edged sword because the more accurate and the more skillful translations that we provide AI data banks, um, with our work as as human translators um it will only grow and improve over time and i don't know how many years that is i don't see it being anytime soon um but finding the voice particularly on a on a weekly series um is just it, it's impossible at this current time uh, meaning getting meaning across yes absolutely um I, we're we're basically there um, but in terms of, of getting the voice right, it's no, not even close. So meaning, but not voice. Interesting. Yeah. So what advice do you have for anyone interested in working as a translator? <laughs> uh, right back to what I said. It, it's not as much what you know as who you know. Um, get out there and um, get into the fandoms. Uh, talk to people, write to your authors, um, write to the editors. Um, of not not just Japanese, but but foreign work as well. Um, by foreign work, I mean like Viz, um, the local editors, uh, get involved with them and, and their events. Um, uh, if if they know you and they know that you're capable of, of good work, I mean, they're, they want people to work for them. Um, so if, if you, and, and also create a pool of work. Um, 
maybe it, it could be something to present to them or even something to present to the world so that you're a known entity um and you know you get your your name out there um uh i would suggest avoiding um trying to associate oneself with with scan so-called scanlations um because you know when it gets to the level of official work then that becomes kind of dicey especially with japan um because japan does have um we very let's call them established rules uh regarding uh fair fair uh fair use but um uh really getting into the fandom putting your kind of with your chest out putting translations out there um and getting involved with with those publishers is and and, and getting to know them and the people associating with them is really what's probably most important uh because and not just because that's how i got into it but everyone i know all the translators i know that's how we got to where we are is, is getting to know these people being in the fandom um even like i said the the translator of of one piece he is where he is because he had a database of the first like 50 or 60 volumes um that he just did the text translations for them and he was known as the translator guy for one piece um that is really what it's all about. It's a lot of it's a lot of hard work to get to that point, but once you know the people and once they know what you're capable of, uh, doors will open up. So, and I wanted to ask specifically: Do you have any advice for Japanese students interested in English? Oh boy, um, I haven't been asked this in a long time, which maybe yeah. that reflects poorly on my students. Um, I don't know. Um. <laughs> um this. Back in the day when I, I did work in um, in high school and, um, uh, you know, I, I didn't work at a um, at a high school where necessarily a lot of the, the graduating students were going to see jobs that require English um, since I was at a uh, sort of a vocational uh, school. Uh, that being said, um, you know, when the, when the question did come up, uh, <clears throat> Unfortunately, I like to dispense advice as nostalgia. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. That's up to anybody listening to decide. But uh, I think about what I did and how I made things possible for myself. And uh, even before all this one stuff, one piece stuff opened up for me, um, the, the answer that I always gave was uh, find something that you're passionate about. Um, it doesn't matter what it is it doesn't need to be uh you know like anime or manga or video games or um uh, kimono or, or something like whatever it is about uh life overseas in in in, uh, in any english speaking country um that you have an interest in find what it is you love and follow it <clears throat> um find different ways of enjoying it um that could be through uh, media. It could be through YouTube. It could be through uh, television. Uh, it could be through uh, TV dramas or movies. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. Just find what it is you love and then follow that. And there's a lot of like, the, oh, are you just saying like the old follow your dreams kind of thing? I mean, while I do believe in that, I'm not. it doesn't need to be follow your dreams. It's follow what you love. Um, and through doing that, uh, if you follow that passion then nothing will stop you because you you have a desire for it and you want to know more about it and learn more about it uh and that's uh, I, for, for me um that helped me get through even the most difficult parts of it because the more i learned um in language study the more i was able to enjoy what i loved and it was it's just this it's this beautiful um you know kind of a cycle of instant returns <laughs> and um uh, I think no matter what it is, that can work out for you. For me, for me personally, um, for for speaking, because um, a lot of people always ask me about you know speaking English or speak, not necessarily reading comprehension or writing comprehension, but you know how do we do language? I said uh, find a find a a movie or a t specifically a TV drama um, that you love and uh, maybe maybe watch it dubbed in Japanese uh, a couple times until you you know you know the story, uh, but then go back through it in English and start viewing it with maybe subtitles and then maybe try watching it with subtitles off and then maybe try, you know, once you've, you've, you've sort of uh, 
come to the point where you're like, oh man, this is so boring. Like I already know everything about it. That's when it's time to start watching it more because um, like anything with muscle memory, um, brain is the same thing. When you get bored with it, you're on the verge of memorizing things. Uh, so start repeating what the characters say. Um, start memorizing scenes or play them out um, with your friends who are also interested in the same thing. Um, those kind of activities, the, it's it's a lot of repetition, um, which is which is great for Japan. Japan's a lot about um, you know rote memorization for kanji and whatnot, um, and it doesn't maybe sound as glamorous um, as as some of the study options that are available now. Study options that I I never had, um, but uh, it works, and um, uh, that would be my my kind of long answer to that question. I'm sorry for to drag on there, but no, that's good advice. I think. You know, my my students, they're always most excited when they have some new hobby or some new interest that they can share with me. So I think that's yeah. definitely the way to do it. I, I do believe that. All right. And my, my students wanted to know, what is your favorite food? My favorite food? Um, I get asked this a lot. And I, I, I would have to, to clarify, I would have to answer that question with a question. Japanese food or foreign food? Uh, which one which you one can you name one of each one of each all right um i can't do one of each because i i love food so very much um <laughs> as you can tell but um um my fate let's do let's do foreign food first my 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 top uh foreign foods are um number three is chicken salad i love a good chicken salad homemade um chicken salad uh number two is uh steak which is a kind of like oh he's so american kind of answer i apologize at least it's not hamburgers or something right <laughs> yeah. um uh but i do like I, I love a steak i love to cook steaks and uh, number one without question because i am from new jersey uh i i love pizza um i am i am mr pizza and uh, i do miss a good pizza over here um uh, japanese food uh number three is um what is number three udon udon uh specifically sanuki udon from uh, kagawa prefecture uh students i'm sure are familiar with marugame seimen um pretty good pretty good it's still not still not the best you can get in in um in kagawa but it's it's pretty close it's good stuff ne number two is sauce katsudon uh so a fukui fukui favorite yes of course yeah and uh, number number one is uh, gyudon. I I love gyudon. Uh, particularly my the gyudon that I make is my favorite. Um, but I do like skia gyudon. My recommendation for super ultra high calorie um, gyudon from skia is get the um, uh, cheese. Get double beef, or or what is it like? Eat it's like one and a half times beef. <clears throat> um, uh, with the the like three cheese topping and get extra cheese, get the Korean kochujang sauce, uh, bring it home and mix it all together. And mwah, chef's kiss. You, you've got a um, caloric nightmare um, for, <laughs> for dinner. Well, since you're in Fukui and you mentioned sauce katsu, I have to ask, are you excited about the upcoming Hokuriko Shinkansen extension? Ooh, Oh man, that's such a funny story. Um, just to to derail that, no pun intended, um, <laughs> is uh, when I first got chosen to come to Fukui for Jet, it was two thousand six. It was like May May two thousand six, and I was just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to Japan. Finally, I did it. Fukui, where am I? Where's Fukui? Um, I I had no idea, which which is really rude. I'm sorry. I apologize, but like I I didn't have the prefectures of Japan memorized or anything like that. So you know, with apologies. But uh, so I rushed to to Google, um, and you know, 2006 again, like like still not perfect. Like you know, reams of information, gigabytes of data on on every part of Japan. But uh, one of the things written on the the Wikipedia page for for Fukui was. The Hokuriku Shinkansen is coming to uh, Fukui in 2015. Um, wow! <laughs> obviously, missed that deadline. Yeah. Um, it was it was something that we were looking forward to for for many years, uh, and it just kept getting pushed further back and further back, further back. 
Um, so to see that finally realized after all of these years, uh, yes, it is something I am truly looking forward to, but I'm still banging my head against a wall why they didn't connect down to my bara and why the hell they have to go all the way around to Tsuruga and stop in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's uh, just it's oh. surprising to say the least. I think it's supposed to connect to Osaka by maybe next century. <laughs> yes, yes. Good luck with that, folks. Good luck. Um, ooh, it's so oh. annoying. <laughs> My students wanted to know, do you have a favorite One Piece line or character? Uh, so this is another, I have, to, I have to do things in threes, unfortunately, because I'm such a poor, poor chooser. <laughs> Uh, of number ones but um uh, my favorite character in one piece is um well first character that i loved was without question mr cool uh zoro um i loved the character zoro um because he was all like you know i mean they, they called the dude mr bushido at one point in the story so like that's how like not japan he is right he's he's not japan um <clears throat> but uh he had all the best lines he had all the like the, the cool moments uh at least what i thought at the time and um after several years um the girl the uh, lady 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 who i was dating at the time um uh who eventually became my wife um she at the time she was just like she's like you're you're not you're not zoro she was like you're frankie and like she told me that for years and like her friends started telling me that and everybody around me was just like you're totally frankie and i was just like fine fine i i i give i surrender um uh, I'll, I'll give into the frankiness so now like i'm oh my god uh, i got to be a frankie fan so this is like the the frankie shrine over wow. here. wow um yeah so that's something a mantle that I begrudgingly took it took up, but I, I do like the character. He is he is fun, but uh, he he took a, another spot. And then after I got involved with the series um, on a professional level, um, is when I started to really have to analyze what wh why is the series popular? Like what what makes it good besides like oh the fights are awesome? Like no on a on a um uh on a construction of the series, like looking at the blueprints of the series um, and the, the the thesis of the series, like what what makes it popular, relatable, fun, um, uh, re-readable? And all of that comes down to the main character, Luffy, um, who to that point, I didn't like dislike him, but I wasn't like, he's my favorite character. Um, but there came a point where I realized like, wait a minute, all of these characters who I love and who I love to see their adventures, like they're here because of this central character who they are attracted to or have uh, a rivalry with um, some sort of relationship to. And because he is this way, because he's been constructed in this way, um, the story has become this interesting and, and main maintained its lightheartedness throughout. Um, if he was a more serious character, the entire tone of the series. And this is actually a nice way to, to wrap things up because this is exactly why I was looking forward to his introduction in the live action. Um, so I really began to appreciate uh, Luffy. So without relationship to first, second, third, uh, the answer would be Zoro, Frankie, and, and Luffy are my favorite characters in the series. Great. And do you have a favorite line? Favorite line. Oh, boy. Hmm. Ah, uh, I mean, there there are so many, but the the line that made me a fan of the series because I started reading it, and I was like, this is this is cool, like this is this is nice, and like I said, I truncated a lot of that story, but I wasn't really a fan until I got to, and I don't want to spoil anything, you know, if anybody hasn't seen the series, the middle series, or hasn't gotten all through the the live action yet, but. There is a scene in uh, a flashback uh, of one of the characters called Nami. And uh, when I read that scene, it's it's in the live action, so they've already done it in live action. It's, it's very it's very well done. Um, but to me, the manga cannot be outdone in in how emotional that that scene is. And um, uh, it's a scene where a character, uh, Belmare, um, says to her daughters, she says, uh, Nami and Nojiko, she says, I love you. And uh, it's simple, simple phrasing, 
It really is simple words, um, but uh, what th the situation that they're spoken in and uh, how they're said, uh, the depiction of the character when they say it, um, it destroyed me. And I was sobbing reading this black and white comic book. And I was just like, what? What the fuck? No, I was like, this is a comic book, like Dragon Ball, like punch, punch, kick, kick. Why am I crying at, at like this comic book? Uh, and that was the first time I got emotional over a comic. And uh, that those that's the line that, that did it to me. So oh, that God. will probably be forever my line. I mean, there are iconic ones, you know, you can make lists for days. But on a personal level, um, that's the one that really made me a fan and changed how I read manga. Mm, wow. Yeah, I just watched that episode the other day. Um, and yeah, it's a it was a I did not expect this is my this live action is my first foray into One Piece. Mm. And I had no idea what to expect. And I definitely didn't think that it would get so emotional. Wow. So I thought it was just an entirely lighthearted kind of goofy show. <laughs> and then here, you know, they're they're bringing out all these like emotional backstories and childhood drama. Yeah, it, it's a surprisingly you know well-rounded story. It's a, it's funny you mentioned that we were just talking about that at the office today. I've I've slowly but surely been infecting the office over the years, and um, you know, one by one, it, you um, you know, members of the office are starting the series, be it anime or manga or live action. And um, we were just talking about first impressions is one piece is like, even my first impressions of it were just like, man, I, no, I don't want to read this. It's just th this artwork. It looks like, like Disney. And like, that was, that was the reason I was into anime, right? Manga at the time when I was, was you know, a little kid, it was like, I, I'm the counterculture. I don't want Disney. I want something that's, you know, the complete opposite. So the dragon ball and the kick, kick, punch, punch, fight, fight, whatever. Um, uh, and you know, what's with this kid, you know, he, he's just smiling all the time. He looks like an idiot with that goofy grin. Um, I had no idea what I was in for with all of these emotional, traumatic, dramatic, um, in some cases, epic, uh, backstories for these characters. And I, I was a little bit worried that it's a bit much for the first season, um, because it, it's, it's a lot of death, um, in a very short time time frame i mean in the the comic book you have 100 chapters right basically basically speaking 100 chapters of material that are covered in these first eight episodes <clears throat> and um there's a lot of death in there that has padding in the comic book so i was worried that it was going to hit um first time viewers as a little bit too dark um but it seems to be just the the, the right balance of the inherent lightheartedness um, with those backstories. So it's it's interesting that you picked that up, picked up on that and uh, and also that 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 um that was a sticking point for you. Very cool. yeah, it was it was quite emotional. But overall, I think the tone of the show was really well balanced. Um, especially, you know, in Yaki Godoy as mm. Luffy, he his like smile and laughter is so contagious. You know, he did such an excellent job. I can't imagine. You know, I saw the video of him meeting um, Eiichiro Oda and, you know, he was saying, you know, no one else could portray this character. And, <laughs> you know, I I haven't met every person in the world, but I'm tempted to agree. So he, um, I, I was there for that. And um, he uh, he is he the dude is Luffy. And there's something. That's really interesting about this is. Oda himself is Luffy and he will he will argue argue vehemently no 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 that's not the case the dude is totally Luffy <laughs> um he he I mean to to a T um and I mean he's much more intelligent than Luffy um you know for and and he probably has better survival instincts than Luffy <laughs> um but but uh his his mannerisms and and you know the the kind of um uh quips that he'll come out with is like uh, no wonder you've you've created this character um and inyaki is also he's he is a different luffy but he is the live action luffy if luffy were to be a person that was that were realistic uh, in the world as ripped from the manga so to speak um inyaki portrays him 
uh, extraordinarily well. Um, and he's changed just enough about uh, delivery and about um, aura um, that he remains to be Luffy while being someone that we can watch and not get annoyed with and rather feel a connection to because it's easy to to go into like cringe territory right um and i feel that because that's just who he is as a person um that that comes off uh that it is just it's it's natural for him and that was a, a big part of the casting process while i was not in the casting process i did give them some lines about um you know what the what the character should be like and how he should um carry himself and some of that did lead to to the casting specifically of Inyaki. So, wow, that's that's wonderful. So, why do you think One Piece has had such a continued international appeal? Uh, well, it it has certainly struggled um, in certain territories, um, and I think it it struggled more than it succeeded in a lot of the English speaking territories. Uh, I think the exceptions would be uh, France and uh, Germany. And certainly Latin America, um, which is is where it's it's found a lot of its overseas success. Uh, and of course, uh, East Asia. It's been always a, a massive success in East Asia. Um, but I think it is the, the reason it's struggled up until now is because it's been fighting that image of of the grinning, goofy looking main character. Uh, people were not willing to give it a chance uh, based on that and or the artwork. Um, because let's face it, um, anime and manga fans around the world are looking to enjoy the quote unquote counterculture. And if it doesn't look a certain way, um, it maybe reminds them of something more Western, which is what they're looking for the opposite of. But it's success that it's found where it did find its footing is probably, probably within in not only the drama, but in how the the character um, the characters are never forgotten by the author um he has a cast of boy we we recently did a counting and it was like a thousand a thousand something characters named characters in the series oh my god um and i don't know whether whether the author specifically like I, i'm sure that he has to look them up from time to time like like certain side characters and things and like like goofy like almost like meme characters um but because of the fans and because he knows how much the fan love fans love those characters, almost all of them are, have remained woven into the plot in some shape or form. Wow. Uh, and that kind of attention to detail um, and knowing where your story is going. Uh, I think that's, that's why it's so strong because the story remains so strong because he developed the story from the back forward. He knew his ending before he created the start of the series. Really? Um, nobody wants yes oh yeah yeah so that's why i think he's able to do a lot of stuff with his chest out because it's not like we have to figure out what we're doing at the end here it's no i know exactly where i'm going um i just am gonna have fun telling stories getting there so so is there an ending coming because i've heard that this is essentially <laughs> you know story i have written a twenty six thousand word a uh, piece that I'm going to try to turn into a YouTube video on on when One Piece is ending. I have gathered every single instance of when the author talked about uh, when the series will end or if it, you know, it, it, it what, what time frame it will end in. And I've translated all of them, gone over all of them, analyzed all of them. And, and I started like last November and I'm still working on it. And um, <clears throat> One Piece is probably not ending anytime soon. Um, wow. every time he says like, it's ending in X years, it's we're halfway done or we're this percentage done. Like, I think that, that percentage of those figures are from a overall story perspective. It's not length of time that the series has existed. So if he says I'm 50% done, what that means is he has, he knows what the ending is and he knows how long he, he knows what big story beats he has to reach to get to that point. But if it was, let's say it was 10 years to get to this point, like it could be 15 years or 20 years from that halfway point to reach the end. You know what I mean? So um, when he says it's X percentage done, it's not in terms of, of years, it's in terms of beats of the story. Recently, he stopped doing percentages done. And by recently, I mean, this This is like, my God, 
like like probably five six years now um he he stopped he's, he's gone two years left and it was i think four years ago where he was like i have five years left and there is no way in hell there is one year left in the one piece story let me tell you wow. uh so <laughs> uh that is just i think his wishful thinking um and him <laughs> being poor at at analyzing how much of his story he has done because it, the one thing I can tell you is that a lot of people like to criticize it and are like, uh, he's, he's dragging it out or he's, he's pulling us along. That is, that has never been the case. Um, he, he doesn't need to, to um, promote the series that way um, because it's already one piece. It is what it is. It has its established fan base. Uh, he just is, a very poor judge of how much he wants to draw. He'll get into an arc and be like, this arc is, this arc's going to take like a year. Um, and he'll end up three years later being like, whoops. Uh, yeah, I guess there was a lot more I wanted to draw here. So he's not trying, it's not a promotional thing. Uh, and that I can guarantee. Wow. So uh, also I wanted to know how many languages has One Piece been translated in? Well, uh, I do not know. I'm sorry. I couldn't um, find that, that figure. I thought maybe you would know. Apologies. Yeah, I, I do not know. No problem. So how how close are you with, with Oda Sensei exactly? Um I mean there there was a point where I like counted the number of times that we had met, um, you know, or, or interacted. And like I, I look back on that kind of like with nostalgia now because I've just I've it's been so many times now working together that like I, I don't know. How many times is it anymore? Um, and I guess that's just how doing this kind of work is. Um, it's not that it's not special. It's not that it's it's you know every time is you're a little doki doki, um, <laughs> but it is now a professional working relationship. So it's it's a little bit different, and you have to carry yourself different from being like the 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 starry eyed uh, fan. Uh, but uh, we are we're line friends. Um, <laughs> so there's that. And I, I think I've seen somewhere you described as a collaborator. Um, ah, on Twitter. Um, on yeah. Twitter. Up until up until I could finally reveal, like just last week or so, that I was involved in a live action because for six years I had to keep my mouth shut. Um uh I put like uh collab because it was just the easiest thing to put and it was just kind of um non non um what's the word I'm looking for? Non not non not non denominational. No, it's non determinate, I guess. Um, so, as an inoffensive word to use, but that's because I do I do the writing, uh, I do the um, writing for the the magazine and the website, um, do the translation work from time to time uh, for promotional material, and I had the of course the live action work going on. So, um, and actually, there's something going on right now that I can't talk about, but it's exciting. I think in the next maybe year or so the more information will come out about it but um that's why i put collab and i recently changed that to uh, i think one piece live action supervisor and writer or something but yeah. okay so ha have you translated the the physical manga or just the auxiliary um information of one piece of one piece never the manga okay. the manga is is in the hands of that gentleman i mentioned uh, uh steven who um who was a fan he did the fan translations and then was picked up to do the manga um, Steven is an absolute juggernaut when it comes to manga. He has done major series, um, and uh, and I I tip my hat to him. Interestingly enough, we're we're the same age, um, so I guess you know, uh, same age, getting into the same thing around the same time, same likes, dislikes, kind of that that stuff. But fun, nice coincidence. Okay, excellent. Well, that wraps up all of my questions. Uh, Great. I have been speaking with. Greg Werner, thank you so much for your very generous, you know, time today. My absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the great questions. It's it's fun to to reminisce and think back on a lot of those things. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good one. Thank you too. Take care. Bye bye.